So what is a functional amputation? I think that question is just as much a philosophical question as it is a surgical outcome question. How hard are you willing to work to prevent the major lower extremity amputation? And is it always what we should be seeking as a goal of treatment? Just as there's no national algorithm, as Dr. Pena related on CTA MRA, there is no algorithm as to when we decide to amputate at the foot as a partial foot amputation or a below knee amputation. This can be quite variable. But when you look at functional trends globally since 2000, the trend toward reducing amputations is undeniable. 73,000 amputations were performed though in diabetics in 2010, but we know by Medicare records that amputations have decreased 37% from the years 2000 to 2010. Major lower extremity amputations well, as well as midfoot amputations have decreased, while toe amputations have raised about 6%. Yet, unfortunately, there's still a disparity in the rates of lower extremity amputation based on access to healthcare, gender, geography, and race. And also, I think this decision becomes more doctor-centric rather than patient-centric in many cases. And we look at this question, multiple limb salvage attempts for diabetic foot infections, is it worth it? This Singapore group aimed to study the patient's ability to return to normal life, functional status, prosthesis usage, and perspectives on multiple limb salvage procedures that culminated in a transtibial amputation. So they had 41 patients who had transtibial amputations between 2011 and 2013, and those groups were divided into the primary group first procedure was a transtibial amputation, what they called a creeping amputation. On average, that patient had about four surgeries, mean of four surgeries. And they measured their outcomes by the Bartels Index, which measures activities of daily living, the Reintegration to Normal Living Index, which is a combination of mental, psychological, as well as physical, functional questionnaire, and a questionnaire that identified whether the patient would undergo the same multiple attempts at limb salvage again. Overall, those two groups had similar functional levels. However, eight out of the 10 patients who were working stopped working, and only one of the 11 who was driving regained driving. Also, 51.2% actually actively used their prosthesis, but an additional four were their prosthesis just out for a social event. What's interesting is if when we look at those two groups, the primary amputation, which is number 24, and the creeping amputation of 17 patients, 94.1% of those patients who had anywhere from two to seven procedures would do the exact same decision-making process again. They would continue to try to do everything they could, have multiple surgeries, increase length of stay, in order to potentially save their leg. The authors concluded that from their experience, they feel that the process of attempts at limb salvage allows a patient to progress through the stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, and this is a more patient-centric approach. So what role does function play in deciding on limb salvage versus amputation in patients with diabetes? Wukic, Rospovic in their group, their primary goal was to review the literature with emphasis on the functional aspects associated with successful limb salvage versus major lower extremity amputation. Their secondary goal was to review the epidemiology, quality of life, mortality, energy expenditure associated with diabetic foot disease. Their results showed that after major lower extremity amputation, which is an ankle and proximal, there was three times more likely to die within one year of surgery. The risk of death could not be associated with their comorbidities. The amputation had something in and of itself to play. Two-thirds of their diabetic patients did ambulate with the prosthesis, which is good. The preservation of function is the primary goal of treatment. Patients who have undergone successful limb salvage, however, feared major lower extremity amputation more than death, as was stated earlier. And as further, the energy cost of ambulation after a lower extremity amputation increased with more proximal amputation. And that was stated initially in 1976 and is still proven. So this is why I think partial foot amputations have a bad rap and have a bad reputation. This isn't a functional foot. How does a patient get to this place? two or three remaining toes, preulcerative lesions. It doesn't even resemble a foot anymore. Once you resect re more than a, a one ray, we have instability now to the metatarsal heads, dislocation, Charcot changes. And then when we take out two medial rays, we can anticipate what's going to happen, right? We're gonna get a metatarsal head three ulceration, and that's in fact what happens. We shouldn't let our patients get to this stage. There has to be a surgical plan. Our goal isn't just to heal an ulcer or eradicate infection, it's to have a functional foot a plantigrade functional foot. Truth be told, a partial foot amputation, a TMA, and a below the knee amputation are both functional. They restore the ability to wear a shoe and to walk and be ambulatory. 
If we look at this, this patient came to my office two weeks ago after being treated at an outside wound center for a second opinion. Why was this patient being treated for this ulcer for a whole year? It is not ulcer free, obviously, and even if you could heal this ulcer, it's not plantar grade, it's not functional. It just shouldn't be. The importance of limb preservation in the diabetic population, there's been no one probably more prolific as the Georgetown group and MedStar at looking at their partial foot amputations. So that they retrospectively reviewed their partial foot amputations of which there were 92 and compared them to the 25 major lower extremity amputations that had no prior limb salvage. The goals of the study were to determine the outcomes and patient characteristics, assess risk factors in the high risk diabetic population requiring a partial foot amputation and compare those factors to the major lower extremity amputation group to help determine and criteria that warrant leg amputation in our diabetic population. At one year, 86% of the partial foot amputations healed. By the end of two years, 80% were still alive versus the 48% alive after a transtibial amputation. Of the 33 partial foot amputations that were bypassed, 99% salvage rate. Even those, however, that were non-bypassable had PAD, 47% of those wounds healed. That's a pretty significant number. In the end-stage renal disease patient, there was a 59% healing rate. Again, not so bad for an ischemic or dysvascular foot ulceration. Their statement was that complete charcoal collapse of the foot and severe hind foot pathology were the only identifiable risk factors that existed in the transtibial amputation group and concluded that surgeons should strive to preserve as much of the lower extremity as possible to preserve function. If we look at this and get more specific on procedures though, I didn't wanna be remiss and leave this study out because it kind of goes against what was just said. If we look at a partial first ray amputation, this, the Spanish group looked at their ulcer, their, actually their uh, partial first ray amputations and found that when you resect less than 25% of that first metatarsal, ulcer recurrence was significantly higher. So I think this is interesting and probably can be translated out even to our TMA patients. Preserving the length of the metatarsal may not be so important. And I looked at my own patient population and looked at Steve here, who's been about 10 years out or more after partial first ray amputations. And, we, and for me, it's, it holds true. He keeps breaking down metatarsal head one. He's not the most adherent to his footwear and I see him regularly and this has been the one site that has continued to break down. There are many functional amputation levels, especially distally. A partial fifth ray amputation, I'll see patients for the last 15 to 20 years who have never had another ulcer amputation after a partial fifth ray amputation, very functional. A central ray uh, resection, if it's one and it heals, which is often in that dysvascular foot, we can get that to heal, often they do well. Digital amputations, of course, hallux amputations, of course. Now you may see there's other digital deformities that can form around them, but those are treatable. Arthroplasty, tenotomy, and adherence to prescription footwear. Of course, one of our favorites is the distal cymes, easy to do, and probably a 99.9% .9 success rate for osteomyelitis, chronic ulcerations, and infection can be done in the clinic or, or the hospital or ambulatory setting. I didn't want to be remiss here either because rehabilitation is probably something that I have underlooked for a number of years. But in this VA study, they took patients who had major lower extremity amputation anywhere from immediate post-op to two years post-op and found that they were 17% more likely to achieve mobility success with intensive rehabilitation. Now, I'm not at a VA, so I can't do an inpatient rehabilitation, but I think there's some truth to be said that every time we see the patients, I'm evaluating footwear, we should be evaluating their functional status level too and try to work to improve it. What they also found was that younger patients were more, more mobile. Again, this is a VA group, but I think this has something to be told here too, because when we look at our patient population who are now aged, this is an, a lady who had been offered an above knee amputation at an outside hospital. Of course, came for a second opinion, saw Mady, and you know, critical limb ischemia, 89 years old, but really relatively in good health. She had bilateral hallux amputations. So in this setting, Next day, had intervention, percutaneous transluminal angioplasty of the TP trunk distally to the distal perineal artery at the ankle successfully. Four to five days later, we do the transmetatarsal amputation with good, adequate blood flow, and about two months later, completely healed. I continue to see her two and a half years later. She walks with a walker, lives at home with her daughter, and goes gambling all the time. A very functional life, and she's happy. Much better than, I think, the alternative. If you're gonna live out your next last few years, do you want to have good quality of life? Why would we discriminate on age? This 70-year-old Hispanic male presented again to an outside hospital, and they told him that his toe should auto-amputate and send him home. So he comes to clinic about one week later after the holidays. I see him about January 8th with a TBI of 0.18. I was not so convinced that this was going to auto-amputate, so I consulted our vascular colleague, 
who did perform angioplasty of the anterior tibial artery. Now, I have a little caveat here. This is really the right second toe. This is not him, because I couldn't find a patient from his picture from January 8th. But it would look very much like this, only the right foot. So he had two hospitalizations, one at the outside hospital for about two days for IV antibiotics and a vascular surgery consult. Then we readmit him to our hospital. And after intervention, I amputate a second and third toes, send him home, comes back, and we can see now, not so good, kind of ominous now, Dis dysvascular fourth toe and hallux. So he comes in for a third hospitalization, a second angioplasty, and then we perform the transmetatarsal amputation. With still some questionable bleeding, but hope that we're gonna succeed because this is such a nice guy and his daughter is beautiful. So he comes in in February and it's kind of soupy. We're, we're not giving up on this, we're taking deep cultures, he's getting antibiotics at dialysis. In March now it's looking a little necrotic. Still though not re really ready to throw in the towel, we're just about four to six weeks post-op, eight weeks post-op, and we continue to do once daily, maybe twice daily dressing changes, see him every week, at least every other week in April. We're still not so good after that early February surgery. He should have been healed by now, but we're continuing good wound care. Conscientious, now in April, we're kind of, we're, we're on third base, we're heading home. And in, in fact, he healed quite well at that point with some mechanical negative pressure wound therapy. And here he is today, very, very happy. And so are we for this limb salvage case. But we, were, we would know that if this patient did have a transtibial amputation, which could have very well likely happened um, under different surgical care and different people, he still had probably a good chance of improving his quality of life. Wukic studied there 41 patients who had transtibial amputations, and the key factor was the ability to successfully ambulate, put on a prosthesis, and ambulate. And that, after one year, had equivalent functional, good functional quality of life. So there are naysayers and those who question what we're all here for, and that's preservation and trying to prevent amputation. Dylan is an engineer out of Australia, and he's been reporting on this topic for about 10 years. So this is the most recent article. And he looked at the literature from 2000 to 2015. And after looking at the literature on the dysvascular amputations of partial foot versus below the knee, he said, aside from mortality, which I think is a big one, by the way, there was limited evidence regarding outcomes of dysvascular partial foot amputations, particularly how outcomes differ between levels of partial foot amputation and transtibial amputation. Available evidence suggests that a large proportion of people with partial foot amputations experience delayed wound healing and ipsilateral re-amputation. People with transtibial amputations increase risk of mortality compared to those with partial foot amputations. Mobility and quality of life may be similar, however, in people with partial foot amputations and transtibial amputations. So there is a professional bias here, and we all have to take our, our stance. What will, how will you view your dysvascular foot? How far will you go to try to prevent that major lower extremity amputations? In conclusion, limb salvage is time consuming. Multiple hospitalizations, multiple surgeries, inpatient, outpatient work. But an ulcer-free, plantigrade functional foot is the goal of limb salvage. Live by the hypothesis preserve length, but not to the, the expense of a functional foot. End stage renal disease, PAD, CAD, and advanced age are not absolute indications for major lower extremity amputations. The indications for a major lower extremity amputation should be a contralateral major amputation in a non ambulatory patient, unreconstructable hind foot, Charco foot deformities, inability to achieve an infection free, ulcer free plantar grade foot, and of course, life threatening infections. Thank you. Thank you.